preparing live stream. Yep, yeah, you got it, Aish. It's going. It's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We made it. <laughs> Woo. Apologies to everybody. We I don't even know if this is actually live. I need to kind of go in and make sure this is happening. But we some of us have technical difficulties, but we have sorted it and we are all here. A lovely group. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm now going to be quiet and hand it over to Joe um, mm -hmm. and do all the other technical bits behind the scene. Yeah. Um, so have a very nice conversation, a useful conversation, and I, I'm now going to mute myself. Thank you, Ash. Yeah, welcome, everyone. Sorry, we had a bit of a technical glitch. Happy New Year to everybody. I uh, hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Um, so... Tonight's conversation is around the miracle within the miracle question. And we have uh, Eve with us. And I was really interested in, because I've read a lot about how the miracle question came about. Um, but Eve was there. So how did it come about, Eve? What was the discussion within the group in Milwaukee at the time? Well, I think that... A lot of people aren't aware of how influenced we were by Milton Erickson. And I should say how influenced Steve was. Steve was such an Erickson fan that he would wear purple clothes all the time because Erickson wore purple all the time. So with the crystal ball technique that Erickson used, um, I think that led to the thought of, well, how can we, how can we do something like that without copying it? And so a miracle instead of a, well, what, what, what would you like to see in the crystal ball? What would you, if a miracle happened? And that's, that's how it happened. You know, it, it very much came out of that, not out of, Somebody saying, how can we think of a question, a future question that would stimulate hopeful futures? You know? Yeah. Okay, so, because um, obviously for, from, from what I've understood, it was almost like a surreptitious um, event where some uh, a client said, oh, there were so many problems, 23 different issues. And she said, oh, it would take a miracle for this to happen. And then someone went with, oh, Eve's shaking her head, guys. Hang on. <laughs> it didn't happen that way, Eve. No way, no way, no way. Okay. So in, in terms of the, uh, the miracle question itself and, and, and the way it was worded, um, when, when did you start to use it in your practice and what difference did it make to your clients? Well, I mean, we all thought that's a good future-oriented question. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, we some of us use the word miracle and I tended to adapt the question to the type of client I was working with. You know, sometimes you just get a sense about a person that they're not into miracles. That so you would say, so if you could, if if you all your dreams would come true, or if you could have anything you wanted in the future, you know, you would we weren't very uh, uh, religious about using the word miracle. And I think I noticed mm -hmm. the literature that came in the years later that this became a thing, you know, like it became a magic thing that we have to uh, learn how to use effectively. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure there are people who disagree with me, but this is how we experienced it at the beginning. So let me ask, um, Dorothea, let us know who you are and how you use the miracle question, I guess. Okay, so I'm, um, I have two roles. I'm a SFBT therapist, but I'm also a hospital hypnotherapist. 
and I use the miracle question with mm. hospital clients in patients. Um, and mm. a bit like Eve just said, I'm, I'm careful sometimes about whether I actually use the word miracle. It's still, mm. it's still that question very often. Um, but miracle has other other connotations in the world of um, cancer care and I'm usually working in in cancer care where um, people will very often say I'm hoping for a miracle for you I'm hoping that the chemo turns out to be a miracle cure and so occasionally I will avoid the word miracle um, mm. because the connotations just aren't right but I do ask I do ask that preferred future question even when people are having palliative chemo, you know, they're not, and the, the chemotherapy isn't expected to cure um, mm. their cancer. I, I will mm. still ask it. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, but you may not use the word miracle itself. Not always, no. Mm. Mm. I mean, how, 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 how do we get a sense that the miracle might not be the right word for the client that we're working with? Oh, actually, I think... Um, it, it, nothing to do with my brains here. I think it's very, <laughs> um, I'd like to take some credit, but no. Um, I think it's very clear, very quickly from talking with the client about best hopes. It's, it's actually fairly unusual that anybody's best hopes are in any way unrealistic. You know, somebody might just gone, you know. And, you know, to that, I would just reply, gosh, if that was in my power, if that was in my gift, I absolutely would I give that to you. Mm. Very kind, mm. it's not. What can, what can I do? Um, but, yeah, I think it's very clear from people's best hopes very quickly as to whether that would not be a useful term. Mm. It's mm. You know, all sorts of uh, mm. bits of conversation come up in that very early bit that give you very clear clues. Um, from people telling me that very recently they wanted to throw a gratitude journal out of the window. I thought, I am probably not going to use the word miracle here. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Not, it's not down to me. Clients are pretty clear. <laughs> mm. is, is that word miracle because it's almost out of... When a miracle happens, it's almost at a divine event, so it's nothing within our control. Is that, is that sometimes... Why we sh might shy away from it? Occasionally, it's that. Although um, uh, a, a couple of years ago, I I had a, a client who was in in a religious order and actually did use the word miracle. Then they were quite comfortable with, <clears throat> you know, the concept of what I meant and what we meant in, you know, that we weren't referring mm -hmm. to something religious. I think it's. It, it's really when other people in other person perspective times when other people are having people are having difficulty with managing how to manage this horrendous event in their life mm. and also having to manage their family and friends expectations of um, battle terminology you know you keep fighting um mm. uh People who are, are are struggling with other personal relationships, managing other per, other people's pain, are less likely to want to use the miracle question, no, to use the word miracle, mm. to use the, the miracle question, but to to use that word because they've mm. heard it already. You yeah, know, yeah. people have come in and said, "I heard about you know." Uh, whatever the latest thing was that someone heard that helps with cancer. And that, right, like, like a miracle cure almost yeah, yeah and that's when i think whoa <laughs> yeah yeah i'm gonna Love use it. that word here mm. marcos <laughs> what's your experience of using uh the miracle question do you use it often um kind of i work with the indigenous communities mm. here in Bolivia, south america so um i'm trying to of course, to listen to people, to listen how how is their own style of dreaming with the better situations, with better, better things, and um, 
I, I tend to use it, but I don't use it or I tend to change it when I think I'm becoming an authority. Mm. So it's very special to respect how people could design their own well-being. And uh, well, uh, everything is a surprise. So uh, we have many rituals here. So I try to adapt the miracle questions to uh, to take people to, to, I don't know, to invite people to describe a situation where the rituals ha has already, it, it, it has already an impact on, wow. on their lives. So that's, that's how I try to manage it. Mm. So you, you relate the mir miracle question to certain rituals that are, uh, are prevalent yeah. in that culture. Yeah. Imagine yeah, that yeah. You, you, you already did this ritual and mm -hmm. you come, came through or something like that and mm -hmm. uh, or a miracle happened. Mm -hmm. and you were able to do the ritual with your father, with your family, with the priest, I don't know. And you could talk to the mountains and the mountains will allow you to be happy again. And uh, how, how would you notice that? How, how would it be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Mr. Green, sir, our research expert. <laughs> the I, I guess what what the the miracle question? What is how how is it useful? What's what's the research behind it? What is it about that question that I guess because um, often we get a vague best hope. We don't really. It's kind of vague ish, but for me, the miracle question almost makes it possible it's it crystallizes it. It, it it's it 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 makes it um it's almost like when you when you when you try to take a picture and it's out of focus and you and you keep focusing it and then you get something clear and and that's where i think the miracle <coughs> question helps so what's what's your what's your thoughts on the miracle question girl and its origins or well i'm gonna uh sort of build on something Eve was talking about, uh, that it sounds like, I guess Eve was saying that it, in the early days, they weren't rigid about using it, uh, that um, the, the main purpose was to be future oriented. And there are a number of different ways of getting clients to be future oriented. Uh, I mean, my experience with clients is, um, they're 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 thinking more about the problem rather than thinking about what would they rather have instead. Mm -hmm. And um, the miracle question is a great way of getting people future oriented, but you can use a scaling question for that or variations of the miracle question. <clears throat> um, I back in the late seventies, I got mid to late seventies, I got quite a bit of training, postgraduate training in transactional analysis of gestalt therapy and something called redecision therapy, the integration of it. And, uh, and in that they emphasize contracting. So that involves what's the problem and what's your desired goal when you no longer have the problem. And somewhere in there, uh, somebody introduced, in my training introduced the idea of a magic wand. And so uh, at that time I was working in outpatient psychiatry at the Veterans Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee, my hometown. And I found using the magic wand question very effective. Um, and this was before solution-focused therapy had been created. Um, I was also learning uh, the Mental Research Institute approach, the MRI approach to strategic therapy at that time as well. Um, and so uh, I found that was a very good way of getting people future oriented. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the follow-up questions. Um, and so for, for people who, for some reason, like Dorothea was saying how you just get a sense for some people it won't work, or sometimes you ask it, it just falls flat. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, what, what are you going to do instead? Well, you need to fall back on that. So you need to have other ways of, of getting at that. I remember 
in one of our many conversations in the past, Aisha was saying how in Turkish culture, a miracle question just wouldn't wouldn't work. Um, but uh, so I found when it works, it is it is magical. Now in terms of the the research, I'm not aware of any actual outcome controlled outcome studies on the miracle question per se, but there's just a ton of research on goals, the, the, the effectiveness of goal setting, getting people future oriented. It, it is, without question, that is, in my mind, a common therapeutic factor in mm -hmm. why it works. Mm -hmm. um, now I have to say, um, share this with you. Um, I came up in a, in a small study uh, with um, my then colleague at o Ohio State University College of Social Work, Mo Yi Lee, we were doing a little study at a community mental health center with a team of therapists and supervisors. And the focus was, on, was using a six session protocol for using a solution focused approach with clients diagnosed with depression. And uh, as we were planning the research, we, we were asking ourselves, is there something unique about people with depression that um, where we might need to modify what we do, solution-focused approach. And about that time, I was reading uh, something, a book, uh, article about depression being a disorder of power, that when someone who was clinically depressed, they, they felt powerless, uh, didn't have a sense of personal agency, so um, in that conversation, sitting around a table with a group, um, we decided to modify the miracle question into the dream question. So it's really a, an adaptation of the miracle question because we saw that um, the people with uh, the studies have found that as a general rule, people who come for therapy uh, do not have a sense of personal agency. They uh, do not have a sense of internal locus of control. Mm -hmm. So they feel like uh, it, factors outside of them are to account for whether things get better or not. And so we, in sitting around talking about it, we thought, well, you know, the miracle question is something that's outside the person, um, external to them, uh, but dreams come, it's, from within, it's our own creation. And mm -hmm. just as um, uh, Milt Erickson was the inspiration for the miracle question, Erickson also used dreams uh, in his therapy with clients. He would sometimes say at the end of a session, perhaps between now and the next time we get together, the answer will come to you in a dream. So we just modified the miracle question to uh, into the dream question. Uh, with the clients in the study and uh, found it very, very effective. Mm. Uh, but the miracle question, it, it's a go-to. I mean, when it works, it's, it seems almost magical yeah. or miraculous. <laughs> uh, Matt, Matt is, uh, we employ him for some reason. I'm still not clear on that yet. <laughs> I do the washing up. I make. I make good a, cups. He makes tea. a good cup of tea, guys. I've got um, purpose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't start her off. Uh, okay. Put yourself on mute. I should, that's it. Um, so, Matt, you've experienced the miracle question yourself as mm -hmm. as someone who hadn't used the approach before, and now obviously using the miracle question with your clients. Yeah. What's What's your take and what you've heard and 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 what is the power behind this question? Yeah, so, I mean, I agree with what Gil was saying there. When it when it works, it does seem miraculous. Mm. It, it seems otherworldly. It's kind of like, wow, the power here. Um, but yeah, also it doesn't work for everyone. It, there's, as um, Dorothea was saying, sometimes you just, you get a feeling, no, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't the way to go kind of thing. So yeah, but um, I think so a few years back, uh, my first uh, introduction to, solution focus um was actually coming for a training here just upstairs where where i was just sitting um and i was i was working with uh, young people um 
in a hospital just down the road from us in London, um, where it's, it's one of the most highest rates of uh, violent crime in the country. So a lot of young people coming in um, with um, stab wounds and gunshot wounds. And, and so we, we got, uh, we were trained in solution focus, um, brief therapy here at FBS. And, um, and I was, I think maybe the most talkative of my, my colleagues. And I was, I was kind of chosen. No, was I not? I don't know. Yeah, 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 no. <laughs> and um, so I put myself forward for all the, um, what would you call it? Uh, I was, I was the, basically the guinea pig. Um, I was sh showing all my colleagues, like Joe and I were showing how it, how it could work. And I, and I remember it so clearly um, being asked the miracle question and, and it was, and the impact I am lucky enough to have felt it in that miraculous sense where I was describing the most mundane parts of my morning um, just in a slightly different way. And it, it, it started as a miracle has happened. Um, how, what do you notice? How do you, how do you know? But very quickly it became clear that it was, my miracle was so attainable for me. It was whether it, it didn't feel before, before asking the question, it didn't feel it would be, but by the end of it, it was so clear the impact it would have on so many different aspects on my life and, and, you know, and those around me. And, and so I've been, I've been a real, um, strong champion for it now that I, now I work here, um, after my training, I've done, you know, more training and after all the, the hours of practice I've had here at FBS, I use it. Um, yeah, I, I try and use it as much as I can. If anyone gives me a, a little glimmer of hope that it's going to be useful. Mm -hmm. And I mm. think that, you know, I think, okay, this, this could, you know, you, as you say, you, you start it and you, and you, you know, you, you get a feel for, for your clients and what they're going to find useful. But um, I do, I do use it a lot. And I, yeah, I find it to be incredibly powerful and a really mm. great way of eliciting more detail. Like you're saying earlier on, Joe, you know, you get clarifying those best hopes and, and get them really clear in, in the client's mind and in my mind, so I can understand their best hopes as well. So we can, we can work on those mm. together. Um, mm. I think having that initial experience of, of being asked a miracle question has really helped me as a practitioner, being able to, you know, use it in my work. Mm. Jason. <clears throat> yeah, if I just sit there. <laughs> thing here and i'm enjoying enjoying the conversations yeah yeah what's what's your what's your take on the power of this 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 question and and, and um the, the difference it makes to clients the the miracle question i mean i love the concepts of the miracle question i love how it works and how you guide the client through mm. this amazing day and then them realizing that it's not actually, as Matt said, that far out of reach, that it is obtainable. But the word miracle for me, I find quite uncomfortable to use with certain, mm. um, with certain clients, as you were saying before. So I, the way I use the miracle day is I ask the client when they're at their best, mm. what would they be noticing when they're at their best? what would be different? And then we guide through the day as the miracle question tells us how to use and, and, and have a walkthrough of, of the client's day, the morning, the afternoon, when they're going to work. But instead of saying when the miracles happen is when you are at your best, if you were to wake up the next morning and you're at the best and the problem isn't as much of a problem as it mm. used to be, then that way... I get a sense that the client is a bit more relaxed regarding the question when you say when you're at your best. Mm. But having said that, when I'm dealing with a lot of, uh, well, dealing with clients with, with anger or anxiety or depression, then using that miracle, the word miracle, helps them visualize this future that a little bit better. So I, I, I tend to use the, the word miracle when it comes to people with the depression, anxiety, and anger issues. 
Mm. When it's behavioral problems, because I work with a lot of kids at school, when it's behavioral problems at school or um, issues with authority like teachers or something like that, it's, I find using the word miracle, they just think, well, it's not really a miracle. But using when mm. you're at your best or when the mm. family are just not getting along is when mm. you're at your best as a parent and when you're best as, as a child within that fam family dynamics, mm. what would be happening at that point? So yeah, yeah. I like to use it when, when, when you're at your best most mm. of the time. So the, the, it, it sounds like um, um, it, it's whatever you call the question, it's about co-constructing a future that the client may want, even though it's not happening at the moment. What are the possibilities? So um, in terms of it being realistic within the client's control, um, and, th and then even getting that in detail. Because um, um, often when, when I'm... When I'm training this, I, I, I use the idea of New Year's resolutions where people say they're going to do this or that, but they don't tell anyone else. They just keep it to themselves. But then if they tell someone else and that someone else says, so, so how much weight do you want to lose? Oh, about a stone. So if he was to lose about a stone, what difference would that make? Well, I'd feel a bit healthier. I'd be able to play with the kids more. You're adding flesh to the to the bones almost. So that is is that the power in this future focus question, whether we call it miracle, whether we call it when you're at your best, it's that idea that I've got a I know where I want to go. Um, but unless unless I really think about who how it's going to change me, how it's going to affect the people around me, it might just sit in my head and I don't really. I don't really follow it through. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? So regardless of what you call it, um, Eve, no, I guess Eve, regardless of what we call it, um, why is it, why is it such a powerful, because I've seen it work with families and I don't, and I will come on to that maybe because some people use it with individuals. We, we as a, as an organization use it with families. Um, so what what's that what's that what's the miracle within the miracle what's the power of that future focus is it just adding flesh to the bones eve what how, how does it what did you notice in your clients yeah. good question is it adding I mean, it's the vehicle for making solution-focused work start. I mean, it's it's the basis of solution-focused work in a way. Somebody comes in with a problem, and we start talking to them about a future with a solution, but it has to be done in some way that that doesn't that grow that is that doesn't sort of make them think but what's what's wrong with this therapist you know it has to it has to fit the particular person as I talked to you I was so impressed as I listened I was so impressed how you all use it in such different subtle ways and how you adapt it which is which is the perfect way to do it. I mean, I'm so pleased when people use solution-focused therapy as a way for the individual who's in front of them, rather than as a way of, as a, I don't even want to use technique, but as a way of working, a prescribed way of working. It's not that, it's our relationship with the person who just mm. walked in and we have a, and, and we have this um, map that we use. And our map says we first go, we first try to see if this person can imagine a solution that works for them. So 
Um, it's that's how I think about it, and I think it's just wonderful how you all use it. And mm -hmm. uh, adapt it. It's not a formula. That was my biggest fear, and too many people that I have worked with have this idea that you have to follow a pattern. And we're working with human beings mm -hmm. and people who have come to us with problems and pain. And that sensitivity is the most important thing, isn't it? So the exact wording isn't important, but the the overall pattern of what we, how we work is important. Hmm. Marcos, we're working with human beings. Where, where does this internal sense of us as practitioners know, and I'm going to come to you in a minute, Dorothea, about the hypnotic side of this question, because I think it's got a lot of hypnotic qualities. Because um, I, I, I I do also get that sense that this is going to fall flat. I don't know if this is actually going to work with this family. I might give it a go. I might tentatively put it in. Maybe I sh shouldn't we just go along with thinking the client knows the answers. We'll just do the miracle question regardless. Where do we get this sense that it might not work with this person, but it might work with that person? Do you know what I mean? I, that, this is where, I, yeah, I don't know, Marcos. Maybe it's a, that that wasn't a really uh, well. Uh, well, maybe I don't know if this is an advantage, but in my country, uh, probably we don't have this sense of psychotherapy. Mm. It's, it's a conversation. It's like someone is visiting me and wants to talk to me. Yeah. So uh, probably it's, it's an advantage because we're just having a conversation that could make a some some difference so uh people is not uh, well i hope that people is not giving me information uh for a diagnosis they just tell me things so i think is um uh for me it's important to have a conversation and uh, if i'm going to use the miracle question i hope it sounds like part of the a conversation where we're talking about great ideas from from Client from people, mm. so that's how that's how I try. Well, that's kind of an advantage, not being a psychotherapist, just someone who's listening to your community to talk to your dreams or a miracle. Yeah, interesting. So it's it's almost it's not a right. I have to ask this question at this point in time. You just go with the flow of where the conversation takes it. Yeah, because when when I feel like if I have this, uh, I don't know, role like an like in a doctor, mm. people will just say will try to 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 find the right answer, and uh, probably they will try to impress me, or to avoid some subjects. I don't know. Mm. Uh, but if I'm just I'm just visiting them, and just being ready to have a conversation, yeah, it's an advantage maybe. Yeah, brilliant. Dorothea, is there a hypnotic quality <laughs> to this question? Um, I'm kind of not very helpful, but I'm going to say yes <laughs> <or> no. <laughs> There's one aspect of hypnosis, um, the guided image part of hypnosis, where, yes, you're guiding from somebody through an image, and that's what we want, isn't it, from the person that we're talking to, that they guide us through their image of their, the best version of them through the ordinariness of tomorrow, whatever tomorrow, whatever is going on tomorrow, we can't generally change those events at all, but we can change our reactions to them. So if, you know, as Marcus is saying, if it's a conversation and they're talking about tomorrow, you know, the best version of them tomorrow, it should sound like, a conversation that they're, they're mm. having a chat and in which case yes there is a there is the guided image part of hypnosis the present within that yeah mm. 
And I think, um, and I love the fact that Eve said, you know, that it isn't uh, sort of a template, ask it this way question, because the idea, I, to me, the idea is that it's, it's, it's the scope of the question is so amazingly varied. You know, for some people, if we say the best version of you, their idea of what they can manage as the best version of them then becomes really personal instead of being the best version of how someone else is managing their chemotherapy, how someone else might manage it. it, it it's a sort of a, a thing you get in, in, in the, the world of cancer care is that a lot of people write stories about their personal journey. And, you know, you can read about how brave people are and when you're in that moment and your family have given you a, an inspirational book of how someone else managed their journey and they're out the other side, you, you haven't got a view of that. You've got the, the best version of you. You know, one person said to me, the best version of me is that I won't swear at anyone when they're putting the drip up. <laughs> I said, you know, would, you, would you be pleased then when I'll be over the moon? <laughs> <laughs> marvelous you know that's it the, the miracle for me is that it gives a person um their own control over the scope of their miracle mm. you know, they don't have to be an idealized version of anybody of themselves or anybody else just just them mm. matt you're nodding furiously I just completely agree and I just think it and it and it ties back to that idea as well that, that Gil was saying about giving someone agency giving you know allowing people to sort of um see yeah like you're saying see the best the best version of themselves and have a feeling that these are the things that I could I could actually change this you know mm -hmm. I, that, yeah I've got power here and it's and it's giving that hope that yeah see this is and and they the, only they will be able to tell you the scope of their power and what seems reasonable to them mm -hmm. and and that will that's so powerful that's such a powerful um thing to to experience i think um finding where you can affect change and finding how you can influence your own experience and your own reality like that that I think is is where the the power is for me, um, mm. sort of waking up to that idea that I could change this. I've I have I do have power. Um, in, mm. in in many times, people feeling powerless and hopeless, um, and then and then that that spark igniting, and then and then where, and then where it can go from there. You know, you just need that spark, and then you know, mm. yeah. I want, to, I want to quote a bit of Bruce Springsteen there. But, uh, Go on, then. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to. Oh, Dorothea put a thumbs can't up. Start. You've got to now. All right, can't start, yeah. a fire. can't start a fire without a spark. But, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, sorry, go on, Eve. How often do you, <clears throat> do you get somebody who doesn't react to the miracle question? Mm. that's a good question how often does that happen guys and then what do we do oh eve we love you you got a soul <laughs> looking up eve you got a soul looking up I, I i guess i'm gonna jump in now i guess i i don't jump into the miracle question until maybe session two. I might jump in, you know, with the instead question. And so if you were able to do that, describe what that would look like. So let's just say you did it tomorrow, what would that would look like? So I kind of do it that way, but I usually ask, if I'm going to ask that the miracle question to whatever the truest form is, um, I usually do that session two or three because then I, I know what my client may respond to and the way that I will ask it. So it doesn't usually fail when I do, but that's only because I've allowed myself time to get to know my client and the language that might be appropriate. A lot of our clients have mental health issues, autism, ADHD, whatever it might be. Yeah. So 
I have to pick and choose the words I'm using. But throughout any conversation from session one, we are, I use the miracle through. Um, so let's just say that happened tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have it through that context, that conversation, it, it tends not to fail. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, most, uh, most people who learn it or teach it will talk about using it as a beginning in a way of setting goals. Mm. I, no. I would like to jump in on that. Is that all right? Um, yeah. To answer your question, Eve, it's uh, I've had a client where I've used a miracle and and I use it in its truest form. If you were to go to sleep tonight and all of and the whole conversation around that and wake up tomorrow morning and this miracle happened and you didn't know. It started off well. But then when it started interacting with other people, mm. it's happened once or twice where that miracle wasn't a miracle anymore because in their mind, those other people didn't, in their mind, they, they hadn't changed the way they responded. And then when they start looking at that miracle, they say, well, it would be a miracle if my mom wouldn't behave in this way when I wake up. My mm. mom's not there to respond back. But in their mind, it would be a miracle. And they don't feel that that's going to work. So then their, their mm. response will end up being the same. So the way I go around it is, is that that's where I flip it to, okay, so if you're at your best, how would you respond to your mum in that way? If your mum did answer back rudely, let's say, for example, for this case, if you're at your best, when you're at your best, what would you be saying to her? And then just mm. flip it around and try and go along that narrative. Mm. And then set up the day by the fact that they've responded in a way that's going to get a positive outcome from the mum. Mm. Then that would change their whole mindset for the rest of the day on how they can actually start mm. being at their best. And then it doesn't become a miracle anymore. But I think mm. it's what Dorothea said. I think it was you, Dorothea. That's a lovely yeah. Dorothea. Um, said before about so if I'm going to use a miracle day I'll set the context so you know humor me I'm going to ask you a question I just want you to humor me everything else around you is exactly the same mm. but your reaction to it is different yeah there you go but the sun you know the sun's not going to come out it's winter and it's not going to be 20 degrees just because you want it to be because it's your you know it's, it's, the, it's your miracle day if it's raining it's raining the traffic's the same, the, you know, the miles, the, the bus is the same, everything's the same, but your reaction's different. So I think it's very important to set that scene. Yeah. yeah. For me, anyway. Mm -hmm. well, Joe said, uh, something that Joe said stuck in my mind about using the Miracle Day. I won't, it's your story to tell, Joe, but I remind yeah. you, so there were tickets to Australia or something like that, right? Oh, That's yeah, always yeah. stuck in my head. And yeah. it's always playing niggling at the back. I think I think I think the majority of the times that I've used it, it's actually been quite the, the description has been quite um normal, almost mundane, because a lot of a lot of the families that we work with um will be in conflict. There will be, you know, arguments going left, right, and center. And it's almost like, yeah, so when I wake him up, he won't tell me to blah blah expletive. So on this day, what would he say instead? He'd say, okay, mum, I'll get up in a minute. And if he reacted in that way, what would how would you respond? It's this interactional thing. When you're when you have a family around you and you start with, so who's the first person to wake up in the morning? Let's set it in their real life setting. Who gets up first? Oh, it's normally mum or dad. Okay. What would tell you <clears throat> that a miracle had happened this day? And they would maybe make a description and they would say. For example, when I wake up, so and so, he'd say, "Yes, Mum, I'll be up in a minute," and then they'd be up, and then we'd have breakfast together. When when the child's in the room with you, it's really the client doesn't have to imagine what someone else is going to say because that person's in the room. So if your mum woke you up and you said you were getting up in a minute, and Mum was calm and there wasn't any shouting, would that would that please you? Yeah, it would. So how might you respond? And you get this lovely 
dance between three or four different members of the family where they all jump in depending on what time they get up. So I might the parents say, oh, I'll go down to the kitchen and Johnny will come in and how will Johnny know that this, this miracle day had happened? Um, <laughs> he would smile, okay, and if he smiled, what would you do? I'd smile back. Johnny, would that be something you'd like to see? Yeah, it would. So if mum smiled back, it's beautiful. When it works, it is magic because everyone's involved and everyone's there. I mean, what you're doing, using the relationship question with the miracle question is contextualizing their desired change. Mm. All, behavior, all behavior is contextual. <clears throat> mm. so you contextualize mm. it in a new and different way, which really is coming from them. Um, mm. Dorothea referred to guided imagery, whereas I see it as unguided imagery. You're asking questions where they have to create an image in their mind to answer it. So by doing that, you're um, activating new neural pathways to try to, <laughs> to bring the brain into this. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, by asking new and different questions, you get questions that get them to have to think of something new and different, you're activating new neural pathways of creating and strengthening them. I'd mm -hmm. also want to come back to your question, Joe, about uh, whether it's hypnotic or not. And I think it depends on how you ask the miracle question. When you look at uh, videos of Insu Berg and Steve DeShazer, I think the way they ask it has a hypnotic quality to it. You know, one is it's their tone of voice mm -hmm. and also how they pause at the end of every sentence to see if the client's following. That pause, the tone of voice, the pace of it has a hypnotic quality to it. And, uh, you know, we, we've acknowledged how uh, Milt Erickson's work was the inspiration for this. And it's, I've read where in the last three or four decades of Erickson's life, most of the time he did not use hypnosis per se. It was much more conversational. And so I think the miracle question, and really actually all of solution focused therapy, but especially miracle question can be done where it has a hypnotic quality to it. And I think that also has a positive impact on one's sort of neurophysiology. Mm. Yeah. And, and, you, and you just see, you, when, you, when you start, and when, they, when you can almost sense the clients envisioning what they're talking about and the, and the lift in the room and the smiles and it's just like wow um <clears throat> this is amazing and sometimes it, it um it's interesting what eve said about um maybe practitioners uh going in too early or because I, I i know from from some practitioners that i've been trained by it's almost the quicker you can get into the miracle question, the better, because you're going to get all the other bits around it. So if if someone says, um, we just want to be happier as a family, I still don't know what happier for them as a family means to them. But I could say, okay, so if you woke up tomorrow and you're all happier as a family, what would you notice? What difference would it make? What would others do? So some, some will go in straight away and some will almost test that ground is that i don't know is, does that make sense can can you can you just go into the miracle question from the client's best hope straight away i want to be i want to i want to understand myself better without asking without being curious about what understanding themselves better means to that person could you just say right so if you woke up tomorrow and you understood yourself better and get around it that way just, does that make sense, guys? Rather than doing all the groundwork, could we just go into, yeah, you woke up tomorrow, you understood yourself a bit better. How would you know? What would be the first sign? Who else would notice? What difference would it make to them, to you? There's no way of, there's no way of every single session is going to be different. Mm -hmm. There's no way of describing <clears throat> when to ask it or when it's right or when it's wrong. And I mean, that's what our students do. They sort of mm -hmm. have a pattern of asking questions. But 
it seasoned people like you, they, it's a feeling. When do you ask? When don't you ask? If you don't ask if, if till the third session, you want to establish a relationship and trust. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah. I mean, are the, are the videos I have of Ensu and Steve, uh, one video, they might ask them a question five minutes into the session. But another video, they might ask it 30 minutes into the session. And I have one video of Ensu where she never asked them a question. Of course. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, mm. And Steve had a way of, of, I mean, he spoke this way. I don't know, did, did any of you ever meet Steve? Personally? I met him once. Okay. He, he had a, a way of speaking very slowly and deliberately and thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. He didn't convert, he didn't speak quickly. So in a session, he really, uh, he was really slow, and as you've seen his videos, you know, and sometimes he'd look up to the sky and think, and mm. you know, <laughs> it was a kind of a theatrical performance. And some people thought that this was part of what you had to learn to do, which, you know, at the beginning people didn't realize you could make this your own. So. <laughs> Can, can I ask, Eve, how did you make the miracle question your own? As, as needed. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't have a pattern. I had to have a feel for the person who came in and how they were responding to me. And if they, if they happened to be an artist, I would ask a question in terms of miracle in a very different way than if they were an engineer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, all of you it's, uh, obviously have all this knowledge, but that's how I, I would have mm -hmm. done it very individually to the, to the client. Of course, it's hard to teach beginners yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, if you experience, then you, and if you're, if you're good, like all of you are, you're, it's so wonderful for you to invite me to hear all, all of you talk so expertly about solution-focused therapy, because many times in the United States, it's taught in two or three workshops, and then you see the videos and you go, oh. <laughs> so, you know, it's just so gratifying to see this wonderful method being used so expertly by people all over the world. And, you know, in the United States, it's, it's not being used very much anymore. Mm -hmm. Everything is CBD. CBT, was it, Eve? Yeah. And that that and that's the same with our national health service. CBT is um, is the main method of delivery because of whoever <clears throat> whoever decided uh, whoever gave it some kind of official stamp of approval. Um, we are we are honoured to have you here. Don't, you know, to, um, absolutely amazing, um, and. That it's it's this and and like you said when you when you were training Eve I guess you train you, you try to train it in in the best way that you can and you you give them a list of possible questions they may answer and if they come up across this maybe ask this but this it sounds like from from what everyone's saying there's a there's a gut feeling is it a gut feeling is it a feeling that you get from experience um, how do you train that. Does that just come with hours of practice? I think some people have the ability or the talent to call it what you may. And some mm -hmm. people can train for a long, long time and always and not have that mm -hmm. rhythm of how to join somebody. Yeah, yeah. 
you Could know, you? everything takes talent. So why not yeah. what we do? Some yeah. therapists are better than others. It's true, Gil. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess it was the, re yeah. the research shows that regard regardless of therapeutic approach, some therapists are just better than others. So, mm -hmm. Some CBT therapists are better than others. Some solution focused therapists are better than mm -hmm. others. Yeah. 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 Dorothy, yeah. you had your hand up a little while. I want to, I'm oh. interested to hear what you what you oh, have to say. Oh, right. No, I was just, I was actually really enjoying you um, putting into words what I was trying to say, Gil. <laughs> The guided image bit is the client guiding it. That's why I sort of said yes and uh, no to the uh, hip uh, bit. Uh, I'm not. <clears throat> I think I think maybe what makes people good at this is having the courage to let the client guide their, the image and not feel that you have to steer it. Mm. So and, and not interrupt and like really listen and not have a, a preconceived idea of how you hope it will turn out. You know, mm. quite often for me, there's a time pressure. Um, you know, um, somebody needs to have their chemo or mm. they need, that there's some sort of time pressure. They need mm. to go in the MRI and they're claustrophobic or something. Mm. And having, you know, oh, the ability not to, or, the willpower maybe not to not to bring that deadline into the conversation in any way at all mm. one, one of my uh therapeutic mantras in teaching and training and consulting solution focused therapy is let the questions do the work mm. yeah i like that i like that <laughs> so can i <clears throat> Oh, I actually had a client, and, and this was quite interesting because it made me think about the way we ask the question in, in the miracle question. Um, she had a client, and I don't know if you remember this, Aisha, the, 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 the young person was on the autistic spectrum. So Aisha did the miracle question, what would happen tomorrow? Da, 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 da. When they came back the following week, uh, the mum reported that that evening after the session was a nightmare, the worst the child had ever been. But in the morning, he was a different person because, because of his autism, what he'd heard was, I don't have to actually do the miracle till tomorrow morning. So tonight <laughs> I can do what I like. <laughs> and I thought, wow, where do we go with this? So maybe it's starting. It, Language is so oh important. But that's, but that's why you need to get to know your client. No, but what, what it made me think is why do we wait until the morning? So mm. why don't we say to clients, when you leave our office today on your journey home, you will, all your problems will have gone. What would be different about your journey home, your meal this evening, the way you go to bed tonight? And this continues tomorrow. Do you see what I mean? Why do we wait till the morning? Hmm. Hmm. Go on, Marcos. Why shouldn't we wait until the morning, maybe? <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Just. It's a very good question. Um, I think um, probably uh, if uh, if 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 uh, the client is going through a very hard time, and probably many people has uh, I don't know tell tell him tell her that 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 he cannot do anything, that he has some kind of I don't know sickness, mental illness. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe saying tomorrow, imagine if, if a miracle happened tomorrow, it would be a relief in tough times, in mm -hmm. very situations. I don't know, probably. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, yeah, go on. I, I had a client yesterday, actually, who was diagnosed with so many different things by the age of six. And she lives her life through this diagnosis. So mm -hmm. every behavioral challenge that she faces or every decision she makes, she she puts it into, um, well, that's, that's because of my OCD. That's because of my autism. That's because of my this. That's because of that. 
Um, so I kind of ask that if, if we were to just put those labels aside, if, let's just imagine we're going to put those labels aside, but just start visualizing it for me. We're going to put those labels aside and I'm going to talk to you just for 30 seconds mm. as you without someone with OCD mm. and anxiety and I just, everything else obviously, but OCD, anxiety just, and she was so scared because she does, she doesn't mm. remember a life without having OCD. So she doesn't know what it's like. And I instantly thought, why did I ask that question? It's my first session with her. Um, and then I realized why I did it. I was quite excited because I thought this is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And it was, I kind of made it about me and not about the client. Mm -hmm. I saw a challenge in front of me and I thought, right, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really, really home in and, and help this young lady, she was 17. And then I thought, why did I do that? She's not ready for that because she doesn't know life without. So the miracle question, forget it. No way. Um, so then we kind of moved on to look for moments when she's feeling less anxious um, mm. and how to look after. And even that was, was quite daunting because her life is made up of all mm. these diagnoses. So did I do the right thing? Absolutely not. Did I learn from it? Yes. Um, and then I kind of just, I apologized and said, you know what, I don't think we're ready for that. And I shouldn't have asked you that question. So let's just backtrack if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to ask you another silly question if that's right. And it turned into this lovely conversation where she felt quite comfortable to talk about, because that's what she wanted to talk about, her OCD, her anxiety, her autism, her ADHD. And she wanted to describe them to me. But actually what ended up happening, because mm. I was now listening to understand her rather than to respond, um, was I was getting to know all these different masks that was, she was trying mm. to manage. And it was, it was very, very interesting. But on reflection, I realized I went in too soon. It was the wrong thing to do, mm. which is something I'm usually quite careful with. I just got a little bit excited, I think. Um, so anyone that's watching, do be careful. Don't mm. make the mistake that I made. I mean, has there ever been one, a, another one on that note, another one of my mantras is one of the best ways to do effective brief therapy is to go slow at first. Mm -hmm. And and that gets at what you're talking about, Aisha, I think is it's really get that connection, that person to person connection first. It's, mm -hmm. it's the therapeutic relationship that is the foundation for everything else that follows. But then what what is brief? because a, a brief therapy for each client will look quite different. Right, yeah. Um, which is why I don't use the word brief. Yeah, it goes back, what is the client a customer for? And you, you wanna find out, find that out. Take time yeah. to find that out. What do you think, Eve? I can see you not agreeing with me. I don't think, uh, I think the brief, uh, that came from MRI. We were, we were going to do something like the MRI model, which was brief, and it sort of got slipped in. And some of us used the brief. In my book, I didn't use that in the title. I used solution mm -hmm. first. And a, a lot of people don't. It certainly is briefer than other models. And mm -hmm. I guess the average is maybe 8 to 12 sessions for most people. but. Mm -hmm. I think to think of it as brief can can be disruptive of the process. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I wouldn't like clients to hear it's solution focused brief therapy. Um, because it almost feels like a fast track way of being mm -hmm. supported. Actually, you know, they just that's just Let's just have therapy. Yeah. Who should focus therapy? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. All of a sudden, by introducing the idea that it will be brief, you, you're putting pressure on everyone, I feel. That, mm. Right, let's let's get this sorted now. Let's do it. Yeah, crack on. No time. For... And there's that is a completely unnecessary and unwelcome um, sort of, you know, uh, a lot of feeling to bring in, you know, 
a lot of these terms have come out of insurance needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially in this, in our country, you have, you know, you have, I don't know how it works with uh, national health insurance, but with us and private insurance companies, a lot, it's, uh, there's been a lot of pressure to be brief. And so that sells it. I, I, I think that, oh, sorry, Jason. No, no, sorry, go on. I was, I was just going to say, I think that's something to do with um, as well. I think CBT, that there's so, so many very structured CBT courses. I think that's a, a reason why it's so it, it's been um, preferred uh, over here by the NHS, because they can say this will be six sessions and that will be it. And, you know, that is and we can follow that. So it's very easy to prescribe that and keep a track on the on the structure of what services you're offering, um, which is, again, it, it's, it's silly, but yeah. I just feel that the reason she became famous in the United States or what became the preferred method is because CBT is an individual treatment. You can, the diagnosis is for an individual. Solution focused therapy is an interactional model. Mm -hmm. And that was at the beginning was very difficult to. Uh, to bill to insurance. And therefore, as time went on and CBT became more better known, um, it, the fact that it was an individual treatment and easier for insurance companies, uh, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with me. Uh, Jason? So, I mean, all these things really aren't, um, have, aren't theoretical issues, they're mm. financial issues. Mm. Yeah. No, I mean, what I was going to say was with, uh, when reading the books about brief therapy and whatnot, and from what I've experienced, I just feel that because it's, so condensed and so quick that it you you lack that personal approach building that rapport with your client as well because you're coming straight in with straight in with the best hopes there's no introductions i don't feel there's any sort of connection between the client and the practitioner um along with brief so it's just so quick and yes the results are there and it happens and you can solve people's issues in a, in a brief amount of time. But that connection between the practitioner and the client, the rapport that you can build, I find just lacks a little bit with, with the brief, with the brief way of working. Uh, right, okay, brief as in? The, the solution focus brief therapy. Yeah, way. yeah, 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 okay, <clears throat> yeah. And there is a lot about that, um, and and Gills said this loads of times. And I think we all, I think you know it as practitioners. If 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 your client feels comfortable with you, and you've taken that time to get to know them, even if it yeah. is about them telling you for an hour all their woes, and you're empathetic and listening, um, you know, you build that rapport, and that's where most of the change happens regardless of the model right Gil because you told me this loads of times and I don't doubt you I think the research shows that um it's 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 building that rapport it's letting the client know that you're there to listen sometimes I don't want you to say anything just shut up and listen to what, what I've got to say be there in the moment yeah yeah, is... yeah, yeah. to ask questions of them to be curious about them as persons mm. and uh, so in my mind that means I might mean spending the whole first session giving them the opportunity to tell you their problem saturated story mm. and I think the research shows it's important that clients feel one safe but also that you care about them as a person and what better way to do that than to give them the opportunity to tell you their story to the extent that they want to. You know, some people 
feel the need, some less so. They say, oh, I've told my story so many times. You know, I don't want to tell it again. So mm -hmm. that, so you just have to fit your approach in the beginning to where they're coming from at that time. But being curious about them and showing that you genuinely uh, care about them as people. Mm -hmm. and, and then that's the foundation for everything else. Yeah. And what a lovely summary that was, Jill. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just ask? Sorry, yeah. I should I just jump in. I'm not sure if it was if it was a quote I heard from from Eve, um, but saying you know, use the method you use is important, but that that comes secondary to you, you know you you should be you should be there as a you know as a therapist first. And the the, the was that you, Eve? Eve? That yeah. was Eve. Yeah. That was, and and it's kind of you know it's, it's a human being. Exactly. Yeah. And it's yeah. that is that is the most important thing. You know, what mm. we get we fail to um make take that seriously. The rest is is immaterial really. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're gonna you you're falling on the first hurdle, if you're not gonna, mm. you know, treat the person as the human being that <clears throat> presents in front of you, that's yeah, okay, who are you? Like let's give them respect to to start there. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, am I correct, Eve, that what we've been talking about here the last little bit, you cover well in your book on um, the role of emotion in solution-focused therapy. Is that correct? That's what I tried to do because I wasn't going to write a book. And then more and more books were coming out that were so technique -y. And I said, before I retire, <laughs> I have got to express my own point of view. and put it out there and uh and i, oh, I well, well, joe it's just just a, for every anybody who watches this buy eve's book and read it yes it's oh god yeah. It's great. yeah yeah i i was just gonna say i'm, 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 still, I'm, I'm still i'm glad it's it's relevant still and that it's yeah. not something that you know went out of style <clears throat> and I, re I remember when we you first know, yeah sorry go on I was, I was just going to say, when we first spoke to Eve about um, uh, our first chat with Eve, and um, she was saying that there was, there was something about that the, the change in the client was within the conversation, not so much the um, end of session summary and the tasks that the, the change was happening within that conversation rather than the task that we gave the clients at the end. And um, there was a blog on Sunday from a certain organisation that I won't name that almost was saying exactly the same thing which you, you've kind of been saying for years, that it's the conversation we have, not, not the summary, maybe not even the compliments or what if you continue to do x y and z but within that conversation and i think what marcus was saying earlier it's it's almost like a conversation and not an interview mm -hmm. that conversation flows freely and that's where yeah. the client starts to think about wow i didn't even if they don't say it out loud wow i didn't think of that that point of view maybe that's something i need to think about um i think it's something as a as a therapy develops, it goes through various changes and we, you know, it's like anything else it develops and uh, it seems so unnecessary after a while to give tasks and summaries and um, mm. yeah, yeah. were just as, as good. Mm. Um, so for me, the miracle question is, is being positively curious about life for them, uh, their hopeful future, however yeah. soon that might be. It's, it's that lovely conversation that love does, almost as if you're speaking with a friend and being really curious. Oh my God, is that what, how would you do that? That's amazing. How would you do that? Um, age appropriate, person appropriate, whatever it might be, don't rush into it is what I would say, but is there any other advice anyone would give as a very quick summary before we draw to a close? Another critical piece are the follow-up questions mm. to getting 
as J Joe said, putting flesh on the bones, getting mm -hmm. behavioral, specific behavioral indicators of the miracle picture and the miracle day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's it's the context, isn't it? Sometimes part of our lives are great, but there's other parts that aren't. And if if the parts of your life that are giving you the most problem were like this, what difference would that make? So it's it's yeah, it's behavioral, it's situational, it's um how I like I say, when when you do it with a family and they're all there and they're all laughing and smiling and and telling how they would react to the other person, it's just magical. Uh, there's no other way to describe it. Marcus, what advice would you give to anybody who wants to or is exploring the miracle day with a family? <laughs> well, I don't know if, if this is an advice, but I think... Uh... Thanks to you. Thanks to listen to all of you. Uh, uh, this belief is stronger in me. You know the, that every session is different, and every miracle question should be a special miracle question for for mm. for every every, every client. Mm. So this is a challenging idea for me. But uh, yeah, every every miracle question is a unique question every day with every client. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um, Dorothea? Um, I think I would say um, trust the client's version of it, you know, to just really go with what they're saying. Obviously, you know, like Gil was saying, concrete observable behavior, you know, to flesh it out, but trust them with it. You know, they're the best version of them is what they're saying. It doesn't need any hints or suggestions. Mm. Jason, do you have anything? I'm just li literally just listening to everything that's been said and taking it all in because, yeah, <coughs> I'm, I'm just speaking. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually speechless because just listening to what you're all saying, it's just absorbing it from like a sponge. So, yeah, I'm. You're disagreeing with everyone, then. I'm just agree. I, yeah. I mean, I'm just honoured to have you all here, just listening to being part of this this meeting. Just I'm hearing just you guys absorbing it all too. I hear you, Jason. I'm absorbing it all too. I'm there with you. <laughs> what so about you, Matt? Sorry, Joe. Quiet. Um. Yeah, I, I feel that. Yeah, I'm I'm here mainly learning tonight. Uh um I'm at the start of in relatively at the start of my my journey um as a practitioner compared to um to everyone else here on, on this on this uh, chat. But I think as someone who first came across it and experienced it on the other side of the question, um to really uh never underestimate the power of it because it can be transformational and it and it is it can be very miraculous <laughs> mm. so yeah don't underestimate it ever as i'm sure no one would mm. but yeah mm. it's brilliant it can be brilliant any words of wisdom for us eve oh because we're all sitting here looking at you going help us eve help us, help us. <laughs> teach us eve teach us i just uh, feel very grateful to have been invited and i am so impressed with what everybody says and does. I'm so happy and proud that what we started in 1978 is being used so beautifully to help people. That's all I have to say. Oh. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, um, you. Uh, Thank you, Eve. Thank you so but much. We yes. have Thank come you, to Eve. the end Thank of you. our chat. Um, can I just ask everyone to just stay put for a couple of minutes while we say goodbyes? But to everybody else, we um, we are sorry for the technical difficulty, but we got there in the end. Um, and I will find a way of uploading this onto YouTube ASAP um, and let you guys know when that is done. But for now, and I'm trying, I'm looking around. I don't know if you can see my eyes moving because I'm trying to work out what I'm doing. Um, for now, um, goodbye from all of us, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. 
Thank you.